Hello, good evening, and welcome back. Here we go again, more coronavirus. And it, it is fun to see from the human psychology of things with, with people getting power and being more comfortable with it, that with people you've seen from your daily life, you've probably seen people will try something. Um, they, they might be timid at first, and therefore they'll just kind of ease their way into it. And if they don't see sufficient pushback, or if they see people going along with it, then they will slowly think that they are actually permitted in what they're trying to say, especially if they're trying to put a few things together at the same time. At that point, they'll see, okay, which one generates the most pushback? Which one generates the least pushback? Let's cut back on the most objectionable piece and go ahead with the most agreeable piece. And that is what we are seeing now. From staying at home, being a guideline, to a then being a request, to it now being an instruction and the the next stage will be a demand and it, it basically is a demand considering the penalties for not abiding by these guidelines requests instructions whatever you wish to call them there comes a certain point at which point the linguistics don't really matter um obviously you try to say things to be uh, most appeasing and encouraging and persuasive in order to get people to do what you want them to say. But then, if you have the power, it, it seems that people tend to want to wield it. And, you know, uh, power corrupts, as as we know. And that seems to be the case here. I'm not trying to go completely black-pilled, of course, but this is the natural progression of things for any totalitarian state, and I'm not saying that we're getting to that point, but nonetheless, the psychology is the same. So as we see from the BBC News today, a coronavirus, staying home this weekend, not a request, UK told. No, it is an instruction. Thank you, Matt the Twat Hancock. So what do we see here? Staying at home this weekend is an instruction and not a request, Health Secretary Matt Hancock has said as he updated the country on the coronavirus. Speaking at the number 10 briefing, Mr. Hancock said that while warm weather was forecast in some areas this weekend, the disease is still spreading. Yes, and basically, same old, same old. We all want to slow the spread so that the NHS isn't overwhelmed because it isn't supposed to be able to deal with this many people because there are too many people, not enough people paying into it in order for it to work, not enough supporters of it, people not paying their taxes their fair share in order to get the outcome of which the NHS tries to do, almost as if the budgeting isn't there. Hmm. Or that no country should be ready for an epidemic or, or a virus. Although, of course, having a um, backlog and uh, a backup is surely a necessary precautionary measure. Surely, it gets to the point where would you think, well, okay, if you're telling me that I don't have a choice with something as integral as my own health, then I expect a incredibly bloody high service in what you will offer to me that I expect you have to have thought of the things that at least I will have thought of just as a lonesome individual and if I can think of flaws and things of which you should be doing in order to generate a backup and be able to be prepared for such epidemics or pandemics uh, especially when you've had a few weeks warning then you should definitely be able to be up to date with it, considering that you've told me I am not able to give myself those precautions. If you wish to take my life into your own hands that much, then you better do a bloody better job of it than me, otherwise what the fuck am I paying you for? Why would I bother putting in that much effort, paying that much, and bear this in mind that money isn't just <laughs> numbers on a sheet and, and just money as an ethereal entity, but it is a value of work. It is almost your your value as a, as a human being. It, at, at the very least, it is a value of your willingness to apply your capability. That That is what it is. It is people who think, well, uh, I, I think you're good at this job, therefore I would willingly exchange this amount of my work to receive your work um, at a, a, a different hourly rate, because uh, I, I, I value your time and you value mine and this is how much I value yours, how much do you value mine and you reach an agreement through that but if an individual is um, needing the, the, the work of an, of an expert and they specialise in perishable goods for example a, a baker needing the work of a lawyer then maybe they need to 
or maybe a holiday, that, that's better then, in, in need of a holiday, and they need to save up the year in order to go for that holiday, then of course they, they can't just <laughs> bake a load of bread or cakes in order to then deposit that to the uh, travel agent because it is perishable goods and it isn't worthwhile, in which case you need a, a medium of go-between, a middleman, um, and this is where money takes the role of that middleman and that's where you get the value of money from essentially and where people agree what money is worth considering how much their time is worth considering technological progressions that is where it comes from so given all that and <laughs> about how much people think that their time is worth uh, essentially and uh, being able to do what they want to do um, we we have here, in order to keep the NHS afloat, speaking of the briefing, Ms. Hancock said that while warm weather was forecast in some areas this weekend, the disease is still spreading. So yes, you cannot go out, even if you think, well, okay, I know what's happening because I've been given the information that you wish to make public, um, therefore I'm going to make the, the best decisions based on that information. If you think this is not the best decision, then either persuade me, or it seems that you're holding information from me in order for me to make the best decision. In which case, why am I trusting with anything else if I cannot have faith in your decision for this? And that seems to be the, the kind of uh, response that we're getting here, which is, if people are going to national parks and the, the countryside, the wilderness even, in order to enjoy their their time in isolation, as we all know that people do go on pilgrimages and walks and treks and the like in order to develop isolation. They wish to remove themselves from civilization for isolation in non-pandemic times. Then why on earth would it be any different during a pandemic time when you're supposed to self-isolate if you wish to get away from it all and go to these areas? I don't see any difference, but for whatever reason, they wish to put a um, distance travel limit on um, that seems to be where they're heading with this similar to, to France or Spain or Italy of course whereby you're, you're limited by two kilometers or half kilometer or one kilometer whatever it might be uh, from your home so if you're living in a city let's say me for example of course living in Manchester um, if they put a distance limit on it then I'm stuck with the other 550,000 or half a million residents within Manchester in which case I'm supposed to what, go for my exercise with all those other people milling about so close to each other, or is it better for me to just head east a bit into the Peak District, at which point there's a lot more space and we can actually keep our distance and still get our exercise and vitamin D and, of course, <laughs> better mental health by being among the, the greenery in the countryside, in which case we're much better to fight the, the disease. At that point, it comes down to, well, hey, it, it's much better for our own health in order to do that, but they seem to be using drones and the like in order to crack down on that and to not take advantage of the warm weather. Um, the way we interpret it, if you wish to go to health, is to say, well, it's sunny and it's vitamin D, and that is bloody important, uh, specifically vitamin D3. Um, the, the supplements aren't quite the same, uh, given that there is no quite agreed-upon unit. They, they just use... Um, in, in I, I see use this like... In, international agreed upon units essentially but but there isn't any uh, objectionable uh, objectionable measure um and that's that's where um we tend to fall down so if we wish to have our health and welfare and well-being then it's important to be able to have those times when we can elope to the countryside and actually have that experience in nature because that is bloody important as we've seen with uh, prison inmates, for example, when overlooking a courtyard or the grassy hills, the, the grassy knolls and hillocks, if you will, then those looking over nature, I, th I think it's a 37% um, less um, rate of recidivism in, as in getting back into prison uh, after they leave. Um, that, 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 is, that is what we find, in which case nature is vitally important for your own health and well-being and actually doing well in the world and well within yourself, in which case your immune system is better off in order to fight off such infection. If the interest of health and well-being is not what is intended by these precautions, then 
yes, I understand why they wouldn't like it. If it is just to try and have a surveillance state, as of course we've mentioned before, then I can understand why they would not like it. If it comes down to just health and well-being, you don't need to shut down the economy. You simply need to say, this is the situation as it stands. These are the people who are most likely to be affected. Uh, 99%, 97%, easily above 90% of the mortalities come from people over 70 with pre-existing health conditions. Then, yeah, there's the information. Do with it as you will. If you think that your business is better off staying open at the risk of people dying, then that's your decision to make. If your workers don't wish to work, then that is their decision to make. It is totally up to you. Then that would definitely be a way to do it. If people then think it is not worth trading with China, then that is their choice to make. But when the government steps in, of course, for whatever bloody reason, they never think they've made a mistake. They just think they haven't gone far enough. So when it comes to the NHS, they don't think, ah, oh, well, huh, seems like we've got a pandemic. Maybe we've made a mistake in telling people what to do and maybe we should actually allow them to make their own choices so that this kind of thing doesn't happen and they are already on their own with their own precautions in order to deal with this. <laughs> no, of course they don't think that. They think, okay, let's quarantine everybody. Let's just shut down the whole entire economy for a bit, at least. A review every three weeks so we can push it back until you find an acceptable surveillance state. That, that is what they do. That is what they do every time. That's why government never shrinks it only goes. Because somebody has an idea, they think, yeah, this sounds good. Let's put it into practice. Oh, it hasn't worked. Almost as if bigger government is a bad idea. Well, instead of admitting that we made a mistake and saying, hey, we tried our best, we thought this was a good idea, you guys agreed on it, but hey, it hasn't worked out. Let's just cut our losses and leave. Instead of that, they think, oh, let's impede further onto your freedoms and your daily life and remove more of your liberty in order to push our agenda further. That is what they always do, and that is why government only grows and never shrinks. So, they have an appeal to a motion by naming two female nurses, uh, but I repeat myself, who died, uh, 36 and 39 year olds, and my sympathies for you, um, and honestly for their own families, yes, of course, my, my sympathies, every life is valuable, but I don't care for appeal to a motion in terms of they are two people, we do have to look at the broader picture. I do not mean to detract anything from those individual families, but they are just two people who have died in the broader scheme of things. Unfortunately for them, that is just a statistic. I know Stalin said one death is a tragedy and a million is a statistic, but I don't want to get drawn up in rhetoric and appeal to emotion when we actually have to deal with the facts that matter. I, I am sorry, but that is just how it is. So, also mentioned in Friday's daily update. Let's just cut to the chase and get straight to that. So, ask whether face masks were effective. England's Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Professor Jonathan Van Tam, said there is no evidence that general wearing of face masks by the public who are well affects the spread of the disease in our society. Right, that to me is at least misleading and at worst malicious. So, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say, yes, so if, if you're well, is it going to stop the spread? No. Okay, that, that's what they're saying. Um, they, they are 70% effective in, in stopping you from getting it as long as you then don't touch your eyes because that, that is where it gets in. It's the it's, it's got to get into your, your body through one of your orifices and your eyes count, of course. So as it does stick around for about 30 minutes, if it then goes into your eyes, then of course you have contracted it. If it is only a small amount, then you have a much better chance of survival, in which case the masks do actually help um, in order to for you to be uh, confronted with the COVID-19 virus less in order to have a, a better recovery rate and even milder symptoms than just mild symptoms as we've seen already. So yes, they, they do help recovery because you're not affected as badly. Does it stop the spread of the disease? Probably not. Fair enough. If you have the disease, and therefore it's coming out through your spittle and your saliva when you're speaking or sneezing, whatever it might be, um, and yes, of course, you, you do spit when you speak. That is why they have spit guards on microphones, for example. Then, yes, it's, it's the high 90s in terms of stopping the 
spread of the disease. And the thing is, 25% of people are asymptomatic. In which case, you don't know you have it, and yet you can still spread it. In which case, wearing the mask on the off chance that you are those one in four would be bloody helpful for other people in order to ensure that they don't receive it. it it's almost as if the the Asians, is by which I mean the, the Orientals, who have had to, to face the SARS virus, uh, also coronavirus, know what's up. In which case they do wear their face masks in order to stop spreading it to other people. And so the, the same goes for here, that you might be asymptomatic or it might just be a mild symptom, in which case, sure, you've already got it, doesn't help you at all. Wearing a mask, absolutely useless, isn't stopping you from getting it because you've already had it. Right. But it might stop you from spreading it to other people. It might limit the spread so that the other person has a much higher chance of survival. It might actually be worthwhile. Because you don't know if you got it, because the NHS is so poorly managed and underfunded. <laughs> oh, well, it's not underfunded per se, it's, it's, it's basically just the poor management. Um, and then other political choices about trying to employ interpreters for people who have moved to England, never bothered to learn English, and wish to get um, health tourism nonetheless. But hey, back on topic, that, yeah, stopping that, the spreading to other people in order to help our NHS cope, even though it should be able to, considering it is charging us an arm and a leg already. Nonetheless, if you wish to help, then do that. If you wish to be accelerationist and to say, hey, this isn't working, here is an example of it not working, then by all means, don't try to help out anybody else. It's up to you. It depends how many people you think um, that you're, you're willing to infect and possibly kill in order to prove your political point. If it's for the greater good, what is that worth to you? That's up to you. That's your own morality. Professor Van Tam also said, The government's advisory committee looked into whether the loss of taste and smell is a symptom, as some researchers have suggested. He said while there is anecdotal data, some people do lose their senses. The data does not show it is important enough on its own to be added to the list of symptoms. Yes, you could basically just be a smoker anyway, and that's, that's probably why it's viewed as a symptom. Discussions over whether patients want to sign a do not resuscitate order should be handled sensitively. Ms. May said, adding these decisions are common, but COVID-19 is no excuse to have those discussions in an insensitive way. So, operations as normal. Brilliant. More than 7,000 NHS staff have now been tested, and more than 2,000 critical care beds, in addition to the Nightingale hospitals, are available um, if they need those ventilators. But of course, we're trying to stop it from getting to those points. And once we get those tests of the antigen testing in order to see who has already had it, then I'm sure we'll see the mortality rate drop precipitously. But all in all, rather good news. Keep yourself healthy, and you should be fine. And, of course, the, the Queen has said that on Sunday at 7pm, she will be broadcasting her speech, her fourth special address in her entire reign as a 93-year-old lovely lady. Um, just, just her fourth address as, as Queen, of course, about the coronavirus and um, what we have to expect, seeing as she is self-isolating as well. And I think... <laughs> and, I suppose I do sympathise slightly for Boris Johnson. Not much, but it is notable. For him to say he's self-isolating and he's trying to encourage that wartime spirit and British patriotism, uh, despite his actions suggesting otherwise, that as he is trying to do that um, and get people to listen to him and abide, seeing as he is affected by the coronavirus, so he's one of us, don't you know? He's also in it with the rest of us rolling his sleeves up, getting his hands dirty, as it were, bloody hell, then, of course, Queen Elizabeth II will step in at 7 o'clock, make a speech for a few minutes, which will get a humongous reception, and if you want to talk about patriotic British spirit, even, even members of the Labour Party, even people who sign up for the Labour Party, who hate Britain and everything it stands for, whether she's a woman or not, whatever it might be, even they really like our Queen, our reigning monarch. So they'll hate Boris Johnson and hope he dies, whatever it might be, but if you're on patriotism, as much as 
it's painful for for Labour to think that they actually accept what the highest office in the land of England and Britain and the United Kingdom has to say. They will actually listen to the Queen. They do like her. They do respect the monarchy. And so when it comes to her address, you can guarantee that that is what we'll be taking seriously. And it, it also comes to that it is only her fourth address. She does chair these things very sensibly and is very cautious in when she has those things to say. She is very, very careful and does them very intermittently. And, of course, with her 93 years of experience, she knows what she's saying. She has a lot of experience to call upon and a lot of knowledge and intellect. So that when she says what she has to say, and, of course, she has a a Christmas message which is tuned in to to many people, if they're not asleep at 3 o'clock, then... That is definitely what will bring the country more together. And as you get older, you care less what other people think. And I am so hopeful that surely, surely, sometime soon, she must acknowledge the state of the UK and how it has changed in her 93 years of existence. Bear in mind, when she was born... I mean, for me, the main thing is air travel, that biplanes were ordinary, and now it's the jet age. So if you think what has happened to the culture, and, of course, the, the Windrush generation being the, the first instance of sorts, but, of course, it's much more recently how cities have changed, and her being based in London, of course, that of all the things she would have seen over her nine decades of existence, then, of course, yes, German ancestry, I know, but being a... British patriot, you know, it, 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 that's, that's what Britain comes down to. I mean, the, the British army, of course, it, it isn't to the Prime Minister, it is to the Queen. That The Queen does have the final say, that's why she owns about a sixth of the world. That that, that is what matters most, and surely one of these days she must say, Britain isn't what it used to be, we should really do something about that. Because when you get to that age, when you're in such high office... That you might have that outrage, but you've got to think, yeah, I'm not really fussed. Especially seeing as she is, of course, a, a Christian, a Church of England, of course, that you've got to think that she's she's got to leave with no regrets. In order, she's, she's got to repent and, and say what's on her mind in order to, to, to go to heaven, surely. In which case, she's, she's got to leave this world with all things being equal and say, this isn't a good idea. And so many people hold her in high regard that even if they say, oh, no, she's clearly being racist and xenophobic when she says that, it will still have an impact. And they will still think, yeah, but maybe she's got a point. And then when you see the vitriol hurled at her by foreign immigrants and any any other invaders and aliens, I think that will only solidify the thought that, yeah, actually she's got a point. Even people who don't think they like Britain... They still like the Queen, and so if she says something like that, and they see the response from the immigrants saying, uh, she means nothing, I, I I think that could really make the, the it, it, it could be the, the tide of change, and that's what I'm ever hopeful for. But hey, I think we've got a little bit off topic, um, basically just the NHS needs support in order to have people paying in who actually support it, and not just people taking out and not health tourists in order for us to see a recovery. But hey! Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this. In order to say, try and keep your liberties protected. Do what you can in order to make it happen. Understand why the authorities that be want you to do what they want you to say. And we all look forward to the Queen's speech. Sunday, 7pm BST. And until next time, have a good one.